Um, as Sam has said, uh, I'm just going to present to you our findings from our joint strategic needs assessment, which was completed um, early in the summer. It was built on a lot of engagement with professionals, uh, residents and service users. So we feel like it's quite a robust assessment. So um, as Sam said, I'm, I work across Coventry and Warwickshire, so I'm a joint appointment with Coventry Warwickshire CCD and Warwickshire County Council with the lead around promoting public mental health and wellbeing as well. So. With no further ado, take you through our key findings from the needs assessment. So it is quite a wordy presentation, but I make no apologies for that. It is built on a very large um, report of over 200 pages. So I've put the link to the full report at the bottom of this first slide. So you've got that for your reference. Um, but really, just to summarise those high level key findings that were coming out, it's absolutely about making mental health and well-being everybody's business, something we spoke about pre-pandemic. But all the more important now um, as we were to live through and recover from the impacts of the pandemic, which has impacted on all of our mental well-being. Our engagement with residents did unfortunately find that people find it quite difficult to understand what support is available for their mental health, um, quite uh, difficult in terms of finding the information and then ne not necessarily fully understanding what is available when they do find the information. So it's obviously a key thing we are addressing. The growing future demand, again, we were seeing pre-pandemic increases in mental health needs, but again, exacerbated by the pandemic itself. So we need to do more in terms of investing in early intervention and prevention, as well as that planning for growing demand on our services, be they specialist or some of the support that you all provide. The short and the long term impacts of the pandemic, as I've touched on, need to be considered. Our local research reflects what's been found nationally, which is the impact of the pandemic on well-being has been greater in young people and in women in particular. Um, also, whilst it's not stated here, people with pre-existing mental health conditions experience worst impacts on their, their well-being. So I'll talk about both well-being and mental health within this presentation. Just wanted to give an image really that helps to differentiate about those two things. I'm sure most of you will understand the difference. But obviously, you can have a diagnosed mental health condition, but you can still experience good well-being. So positive well-being is about feeling good and functioning well. Um, and whatever your mental health diagnoses or, or um, conditions are, you can experience good or poor well-being. The JSNA highlighted a number of inequalities in terms of access and outcomes for mental health support. So I just wanted to pick out a few of those key ones here. Um, so in terms of socioeconomic impacts, for sure you're familiar with you know, higher mental health challenges experienced by people living in more deprived areas. When we look at this for people with severe and enduring mental illness, SMI, um, so particularly thinking about psychoses, bipolar, schizoaffective type disorders, we find that um, people living in the most deprived 20% of the population across Coventry and Warwickshire were three times more likely to be admitted to hospital for their SMI um, than people with SMI, but living in the most affluent 20% of the population. And then in terms of comparing with the general population, people with severe and enduring mental illness are three times more likely to attend A&E or five times more likely to be admitted for their physical care needs, um, which touches on the fact that people with SMI uh, often present later for some of their physical health conditions and some of that is associated with what we call diagnostic overshadowing. So um, some of their health conditions perhaps being overlooked because people see the mental illness first. Um, we see higher access to mental health support by people from white British backgrounds, particularly around common mental health issues, depression, anxiety, et cetera. Um, but there are concerns around increased risks ethnic group in terms of impacts on mental health. So again, that's something we need to look at. Um, we know that people from ethnically diverse backgrounds tend to have greater difficulty understanding the support that is available. Um, and when they do access support, um, may feel that the, the support provided isn't sensitive enough to their cultural background um, and the particular needs presented with that. As well, this is something that's been um, known really for a number of years now nationally, uh, black people, 
if you like, considered more likely to be considered bad than sad, so much more likely to enter mental health services through a criminal justice route um, than traditional health routes. When we look at the wider determinants, so mental health obviously is complicated and influenced by both biological and social factors. Um, and some of the, the gradients seen in hospital admissions for people with SMI, for example, I think it highlights how wider difficulties around financial security, housing security can exacerbate mental health challenges. So a really important feature of the needs assessment was considering those wider determinants. So we know domestic violence, abuse, drugs, alcohol really impact on your mental health and well-being and have increased during the pandemic. Additionally, um, the, the impact from the pandemic was higher amongst unemployed people, people from ethnically diverse backgrounds, younger people, as I've said, um, older adults with pre-existing physical or mental health conditions, people um, from LGBT. IQA plus groups. Um, carers we know are just so vital in terms of the support that they provide for people with mental health conditions as well as physical health conditions and supporting their well-being. It has to be a priority in terms of helping them to help us reduce demand on health services. Unfortunately though a health watch survey found that over half of carers found it difficult to access support for well-being. Um, I won't go through all of these, but just wanted to, because you can read them for yourself, but wanted to pull out the importance of green space. I think we've all recognised actually how important access to green spaces are for our well-being, particularly during the, the pandemic. That's really kind of brought it to the fore for all of us. And despite being particularly in Warwickshire, quite a rural area, actually, you know, we know people even in rural areas can have difficulty um, making use of the green spaces around them and actually being able to, to get in there. Um, but in terms of Coventry, obviously, and rugby being more urban areas, access to, to just gardens and green space is lower. So one of the really important things that we need to do in addressing health inequalities is actually improve our data recording. So I've just pulled this out from the needs assessment as an example. Um, so CWPT, Coventry Warwickshire Partnership Trust, our mental health specialist providers, record ethnicity for all their patients, as do other health providers. And this is really important in terms of giving us the data to understand actually is access to service equitable? Are there groups that are misunderrepresented within our services? Um, but we know there are barriers to recording this information. So sometimes staff might not feel comfortable asking the question. And additionally, patients may question why the information is needed. As I said, it's really important so we get a picture, an accurate picture of who is or isn't accessing support. And one of the challenges, as I say, this kind of other or no unknown category has increased slightly in terms of that, that percentage in that box over recent years. And we know within there, there's likely to be a bias for people from um, ethnic, minority ethnic communities. So that is, again, something we are looking to address with in terms of staff development, but also doing some research to understand how residents feel about being asked that question. So that's a bit of background. I'm now, now going to take you through the recommendations that are in the report and I'll present these for particular topics and then give a, a couple of slides on each as to why we've made those recommendations. So as I've already said, we need to strengthen our investment in prevention and early intervention um, and we want all organisations. So this has been a push for public sector organisations, but beyond that, we're encouraging that all organisations consider mental health and wellbeing in their pandemic recovery plans. And then specifically when we look at common men mental health disorders, so depression and anxiety disorders, um, I'll show some charts in a minute which, which show the gap, the difference between expected prevalence in our communities and the rate of people coming forward to um, services, particularly IAPT, are improving access to psychological support um, or Healthy Minds service, as it's now called. So there is an inequity, so we need to work with referrers to improve that footfall for particular areas. Um, access to Healthy Minds is a self-referral process as well, so you can be referred by a professional or you can refer yourself. Um, so we need to both work with, with referrers more formally and raise awareness of the support in our communities. And we want to do that through strengthening community engagement with yourselves um, and with wider partners, including local businesses. 
Um, and then we're also looking at support that goes into care homes as well, given the, the impact on wellbeing for them, particularly again, associated with the pandemic impacts. So this is some data from the ONS, which shows the impact of the pandemic on four key measures of wellbeing. So satisfaction with life, feeling that life is worthwhile, happiness and anxiety. So the grey dotted line here is the pre-lockdown, so kind of before the first lockdown um, levels. And you can see life satisfaction has dropped. You can see um, feeling that life is worthwhile declined. Um, so it's up to March 2021, but obviously with the um, developments over the last couple of weeks with the emergence of the Omicron variant, I expect these um, figures to kind of show a similar pattern for the next few months as well. Happiness levels have been a bit up and down, um, but have declined um, with particular impacts around those lockdown periods. And anxiety has been consistently above the lockdown, uh, sorry, the pre-lockdown levels. So just this one really concerns me when we look at self-reported uh, self-worth figures. So the comparison from 2019 in the green and the red April 2021, you can see across all age groups, that feeling of low self-worth has increased, but importantly, it's statistically significantly higher than it was pre-pandemic amongst our younger population. So 16 to 34 year olds there, you can see from around 3% for 16 to 24 year olds pre-pandemic up to almost 12% um, during the, the pandemic, so in April 21, and similar picture for the 30, uh, 25 to 34 age group. And some of this may be related to employment, education disruption, um, but also that, that inability to really engage with meaningful activities uh, whilst things were just not happening within communities in terms of activities and, and supporting engagement with hobbies, etc. So this then touches on what I mentioned earlier around the need versus access to support for common mental health issues. So these are prevalence estimates. So um, adult population, their working age population in yellow and older age in the purple. And you can see the highest estimated prevalence is within Coventry and then the north um, of Warwickshire. When we then look at access to IAPT or Healthy Minds, you can see it tends to be higher in the south in Rugby and the south of Warwickshire. They, um, Access rates, uh, so the targets are the dotted lines for our IAP service, those are nationally set targets, and our service does meet the access rates within the north of Warwickshire, however you could still see it's um, not quite the same kind of pattern that you see against the estimated need, but importantly Coventry is where we really need to improve access to um, Healthy Mind service. And then a slightly different picture within older adults, particularly in terms of not hitting that, that target for North Warwickshire, where need is estimated to be high. So that was common mental health disorders. I was then going to go on to talk a little more about severe and enduring mental in health, ill health. So um, the recommendations you can see here around improving community engagement to promote awareness of severe mental illness um, and the support that is available really developing a more integrated pathway. So we know, as I said, that the inequality in terms of physical health, so people with SMI have around a 15 to 20 year lower life expectancy than the general population. And that is primarily related to poorer physical health conditions. Some of that being around, as I said before, diagnostic overshadowing, some of it being related to medications that they may, may be prescribed. Um, and some of it potentially relating to, to broader barriers to access. So tending to present later um, for, for physical health needs and more often in an emergency, rather than having that earlier um, identification of, of poorer physical health or physical health needs. So there is a programme of annual physical health checks for people with SMI that are delivered through primary care. So we are pushing to promote that service now. And we've um, had a proactive outreach service that's been working within Coventry for recent, through recent months. And that's now being rolled out through Warwickshire as well. Where we've got healthcare assistants that will support primary care GPs in delivering these health checks and do community outreach 
but really importantly, making sure that people are then signposted into health promoting support within communities. So Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, who I saw in the, on the call today, are supporting us with this. So they um, support people with severe mental illness to engage with the natural environment with both physical and mental health um, benefits. And we need to do more of that. And we know people, you'll, you'll have people accessing your service that have uh, SI diagnoses may be eligible for these health checks, but perhaps not aware. So it's really supporting, promoting awareness and encouraging people to attend annual physical health reviews. And that touches on the, the next recommendation around really promoting the parity of esteem between physical and mental health um, support so that both are equally recognised as important. We know people with SMI are more likely to be on multiple medications or polypharmacy. So we're conducting a programme of local audits to really understand that picture and ensure that people are getting the most appropriate medications but not being um, over, over prescribed. So in terms of the, some of the inequalities we found, I've already mentioned the life expectancy gap. In terms of the wider determinants, we also find people with SMI tend to have lower employment rates, um, so about 67% lower than the general population, and about 50% of ESA uh, benefits claimants have a primary mental health or behavioural condition. So that's not necessarily just SMI, but it gives you a picture of that financial insecurity experienced by people with um, enduring mental illness. We know that loneliness and isolation um, can really impact people with SMIs and more likely to um, have challenges maintaining rela relationships within communities and that really exacerbating um, their poorer well-being, mental, poorer mental health um, status. And additionally, housing. So people receiving um, mental health, secondary mental health services are more likely to be um, uh, needing support for their housing as well and lower levels of independent living amongst people with SMI. I then just wanted to, sorry about the high uh, number of numbers within this, but I think it's really important. So it just starts to highlight actually the activity and the cost associated with emergency hospital admissions. So this is a priority for our system, one, because it's important to improve um, or reduce health inequalities for this cohort, but it will come with um, financial savings if we get this proactive preventative approach right. Um, so what we see is an increasing trend in terms of the cost of people attend with SMI attending um, hospital as an emergency over the years. And this is broken down by place. I won't go through all of it. You'll have these slides sent out afterwards so you can look at it at your leisure. But these tables really highlight that actually the biggest benefits are to be had where people are just having one or two emergency hospital admissions a year. We are not necessarily talking about those who may be well known to hospital services because they're presenting a number of times. Actually, just by getting those physical health checks in, identifying physical health conditions earlier, they could make real benefits in terms of reducing emergency admissions um, and, and cost savings for the, the health system. So it's split down there of Coventry Rugby, North Warwickshire and South Warwickshire um, in terms of our, our places that we're working within across the patch um, within our emerging integrated care system. And this I've already touched on, but just shows you graphically that gradient associated with people with SMI uh, being admitted to hospital against their deprivation quintile. So quintile one being the most deprived and five the least deprived areas. And then just wanted to um, flag some of the quotes that we received during our engagement. So really highlighting that people with SMI want uh, and recognise a need for improved connection between the various parts of our health system in terms of improving their, their patient journey and their mental health and physical health outcomes. So then on to personality disorder, um, a condition which is quite broad really in terms of its definition, but quite poorly understood. Um, we know we need to improve kind of compassionate understanding around PD 
amongst the health and care system um, and I would include the broader support available from BCSE in that we know there are gaps within our commissioning currently for specialist services which is something we are looking at through our mental health transformation programs and we need to improve pathways for people not just into specialist services but again that broader offer of support. So again just to pull out a few of the findings to support this so Nationally, um, studies suggest around 8% of the adult population live with some form of a personality disorder. So that would be over 80,000 people within Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, emotionally unstable personality disorder or EUPD is a form that is most likely um, for people to require some support. And that is um, around to be about a 1% est uh, prevalence estimate, which would be 10,000 living in Warwickshire. There's high risk of death by suicide amongst people with EUPD um, and we also recognise that given the high number of people estimated to be with PD it is I have to say unlikely that we would necessarily be diagnosing everybody just in terms of the capacity that exists within the system um, but also in terms of people coming forward, asking for support, many people with PD will be able to live successful lives within the community. That said, many are likely to be accessing support from your services from the voluntary and community sector already. Um, so there is a need to improve awareness and we're develop developing some training packages and um, stories from people with lived experience of PD that we will be sharing in future months to help with that broader understanding. So as I say, we recognise um, local provision is patchy and it is a key work stream within our mental health transformation work stream. Um, I wanted, so this quote at the bottom is one that I've not, that isn't referenced in the JSNA, but when presenting some of this data to our personality disorder um, pathway working group, actually one of the experts by experience made, said this, and it really struck a chord with me in terms of actually Improving the well-being for people with PD isn't all about specialist services, but having more mental health friendly communities, uh, more inclusive communities, and the quote being a simple hello from the postman can make all the difference. And that was talking about, you know, how, how you start your day and how um, your well-being can be affected by just really simple interactions that make you feel more accepted within communities. So uh, the next theme is around parent and infant mental health. We have a priority work stream within our local maternity system around the um, 1001 critical days, looking at well-being of parents and infants. So we know that it develop, brain development in the early years is really important in terms of reducing risks for longer term, both physical and mental health um, outcomes. So we continue to develop our support for both mothers and um, for fathers and partners, so a recognition that we need to do more to support um, partners during the, when I say 1001 critical days, that is from conception through to when the child is age two and is a really key developmental period for the child, but also um, a risk period for parents in terms of their mental health and well-being. And we also know that we need to improve support from mothers and fathers from ethnically diverse communities. There's a better offer in Coventry um, than we have in Warwickshire at the moment. Um, so we're again, another area that we're working with the CCG to improve support. And, and in this space, again, it's not all about access to our specialist perinatal mental health services, but peer support approaches to help normalize difficulties and give people shared um, access to shared experiences and learning from others can really help too. So again, some of the stats um, relating to parent and infant mental health, around a fifth of mothers are estimated to experience mental health um, during that perinatal period. So that's actually from birth to one year, um, sorry, conception to one year after birth would be what we call the perinatal mental health, uh, sorry, perinatal period. Um, and we also estimate around 10% of fathers um, or partners are likely to experience mental health challenges in that time too. Sadly, deaths by suicide are one of the leading causes of death amongst new mothers um, outside of the kind of birth complications uh, in the very few weeks around um, uh, after giving birth. 
Um, and additionally, we know that around 20% of women who die in that postnatal period have an associated mental health condition. So hence why this is a real priority for our system at the moment. Um, unfortunately, awareness of support again is quite low, both amongst parents, but also amongst frontline workers. So that was built on study from 2017 within Warwickshire. So we did a large survey of parents and of frontline workers working with um, parents. And, that, and off the back of that, we set up our, our 1001 days working group. And again, we see um, inequalities in terms of ethnicity as well. So an underrepresentation of people from ethnically diverse backgrounds within our specialist perinatal services. Um, dis and uh, alongside that, we see that kind of knowledge and understanding around perinatal mental health is lower in ethnically diverse communities that compared to the general population. And then there's additional barriers such as stigma, cultural and language barriers that may present, prevent people from accessing the support in a, in a timely manner. A few quotes here, one from a parent around um, the experience of giving birth and becoming a new parent during the pandemic and how lonely um, they found it to be. And then from a professional too, kind of the flip side, recognizing that um, the challenges that pregnant women, new parents have found as a result of the pandemic in terms of access to services um, and, and support in its broader sense, if you like. So you can see the vast majority of, of new mothers said they experienced, they found they received less practical support from family and friends than they perhaps expected. Obviously we had uh, restrictions on our social contacts, which would have influenced that. Missing out on social groups and experiences. Again, lots of things were stood down in the community that parents would normally be able to access to help build that social support um, and definitely an impact on mental health and wellbeing. Um, and unfortunately, the majority saying they struggled to access more formal services and support as well. Sorry, so there's a lot to get through, so whiz through all these topics. Um, but onto eating disorders, again, we have it, we recognise we have an inequity within Coventry and Warwickshire in terms of the services av available to people with eating disorders, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, and whilst the majority of eating disorders are diagnosed within women, there has been a growing recognition um, that men can also experience eating disorders and we need to make sure that we are recognising and providing services as appropriate. Um, additionally, then kind of gender dysmorphia can blur the lines in terms of recognising eating disorders. So we also need to be looking at um, people who are transgender or non-binary and making sure um, any eating disorders are appropriately recognised and serve appropriate services are provided um, as well. So you can see here in terms of that statistic, 90% of people with in, of in, people admitted to hospital with an eating disorder, so on that severe end, are female. Um, but over recent years, we have seen greater recognition of eating disorders in men. Um, but that concern of that eating disorders amongst people who are transgender or non-binary may be, be being um, missed. Um, the majority being of hospitalizations, again, being amongst younger adults, but important not to forget this can affect older adults as well. So 10, uh, over 10% of hospitalizations in 1819 were to adults aged over 50, so around 50% were in the 18 to 29 year old um, age group. And again, concerns around um, our ethnically diverse communities which may experience um, more levels of stigma, lower understanding of support available, and hence um, less likely to be referred to access, uh, referred to specialist support, um, despite concerns around there potentially being greater risks in those communities. A bit in brackets and in italics, I've added since the JSNA was completed, just to note that um, there was a national study that found eating disorder referrals, um, sorry, admissions have been rising at a faster rate for um, people from ethnically diverse communities compared to white people. Um, so that was identified within the NHS in October 2020. So it may be that some of that is changing, but again, this point around um, accessing care in, as an emergency admission may suggest that the challenges are not being picked up earlier, um, uh, uh, early as they should be, and therefore people missing out on timely support. 
So when I said about the inequity in terms of our specialist service provision, Coventry has a service in place for people with mild to moderate eating disorders, whereas Warwickshire has a more specialist service in place for people with severe eating disorders. So that is something, again, the mental health transformation program is working to address. So then moving to learning difficulties and autism, we know that um, both of these groups are at increased risk of experiencing mental health, but can experience barriers to accessing services. Again, some of which is related to diagnostic overshadowing. So um, professionals may not recognize or appropriately diagnose mental health conditions because they see the learning disability or the autism first. Um, there's some initial, uh, some additional areas around meditation for people with learning disabilities. Um, and we have a program similar to the SMI that's been running a bit longer around annual physical health checks for people with LD, for which I have to say coverage is pretty good and has, has increased over the pandemic, which is really positive. Um, so really awareness and understanding of both autism and learning difficulties is something we need to build across all of our services. So again, applies to BCSE to ensure that people can access support and reasonable adjustments are made to enable them to um, make use of the support that is available. So to look at learning disabilities, we know that around 2% uh, of adults and 2.5% of children live in the UK with a learning disability. So you've got your numbers there in terms of how that applies to Coventry and Warwickshire, over 7,000 people in Coventry and over 10,000, almost 11,000 people in Warwickshire likely to be living with a dis learning disability. And around fifth, uh, a fifth of people with learning disabilities are likely to experience a mental health problem compared to around 4% of the general population. So you can see that difference there is quite stark. And the more severe the learning disability, the higher the prevalence of poor mental health um, is in that, in that cohort. Some of this is associated again to experiences around negative life events um, and discrimination. Um, so more likely to experience trauma such as abuse, more likely to live in poverty or experience discrimination and then potentially having poorer coping me mechanisms or poorer access to support, really exacerbating the challenge that people with LD face. And I've touched on the diagnostic overshadowing point. And then autism. So obviously you can have comorbid learning disabilities and autism, um, or, or people can have one or the other separately. Where people just have um, autism, studies suggest that actually they have a nine times increased risk of dying by suicide. So reflecting the higher um, challenge around their mental health. However, we know that people experience challenges accessing mental health support if they have autism. Um, and this has been recognized by services. It's something that's being addressed, but will take time. And um, you can see there from a, a quote from a professional, sadly recognizing that um, people with autism often tend to struggle to get proper access to mental health support because uh, professionals will see their autism first and, and assume their difficulties are autism related rather than necessarily being about the um, mental health challenges they're experiencing. During the pandemic as well, we know that people with autism were more severely impacted um, and a study suggesting that they were over seven times more likely than the general population to experience chronic loneliness. So then another theme in the needs assessment was specifically looking at suicide prevention. And you can see the recommendations there. We need to have a real focus on supporting primary care. So um, GP practices um, to really upskill them in being able to recognize suicide risks and support people appropriately, improving timely access to support. And one of the challenges can be actually when people present perhaps to primary care or others, so they disclose that they may be experiencing suicidal thoughts and they're referred to services, but that waiting period can be a real risk time. So they may feel that they've opened up and then are kind of left hanging. So we need to look at support throughout. Um, most people who die by suicide have not had recent access with mental health services. So actually we've got a whole program of work to really improve training, awareness and understanding within communities themselves, um, recognizing that people will often turn to a friend to talk about these challenges rather than necessarily 
uh, professional mental health services. But we do have, um, we have increased our community support. So we've got safe havens within both Coventry and Warwickshire, which offer community-based drop-in support um, out of hours. So in the, in the evenings, 365 days of the year. We need to build on and to continue to strengthen that. We've also introduced a real-time surveillance system. So we get notifications within public health from the coroner's office of deaths by suicide, which is a massive improvement. So um, we, it used to be that we would only have information on deaths by suicide when that detail was released by the ONS, which would be at best around a year out of date. Um, so off the back of having a real-time surveillance system in, in place, we are able to much more, quick, uh, more quickly identify changes in risk factors and any potential clusters that may be within our communities. And, and over the last year, that's proved to be a real asset um, that we have, we have acted upon. We are updating our suicide prevention strategy. We, we did loads of work around suicide prevention over the last three years. We had some additional funding from NHS England, particularly focusing on uh, reducing risks amongst middle-aged men who were the, the highest risk group. Um, and I'm pleased to say, so um, that rates have come down. So these red dots is where we were significantly higher than the national average for deaths by suicide in Warwickshire. And you can see how that's reduced. So um, I think evidence to show that the importance really of partnership working. So suicide prevention is both about for sure the crisis and the specialist support that people need access to, but actually we need to do loads in that wellbeing space. Um, I would say promoting wellbeing is the first step around suicide prevention. So it's having a really holistic approach to um, supporting people who may be at risk of suicide. Some of the risk factors are listed here. So having a mental health condition and then some of those wider social factors around relationship breakdown, housing or financial insecurity, loneliness, chronic pain. Um, they are listed there and that's a mixture of um, risk factors based on both local and national evidence. Around 75% of deaths by suicide occur in men. Um, and amongst men, it tends to be that middle-aged cohort. So locally, over a, a two and a half year period, we found the highest rates amongst men aged 20 to 59. Um, for women, it was a, a slightly smaller age group in terms of 30 to 49 being the, being the highest. Oh, sorry, no, that's men. Women were 20 to 39 and 30 to 49 was the highest group, so fairly similar. I've included a chart here around hospital admissions for self-harm for young people, um, which sadly you can see we are higher than the national average, particularly within Warwickshire. Um, the majority of people who die by suicide have had a previous self-harm attempt, so about two thirds. However, it's really important to um, note that, that self-harm in itself is not a strong predictor of suicide attempts. So only around 2% of people who self-harm are likely to go on to make a suicide attempt. So um, it's, help, it's important to kind of hold that balance in mind. But nonetheless, it is something we keep an eye on in terms of that broader um, picture really around how people are coping. So then rather than the kind of mental health topics or themes, we've moved on to look at some of the, the broader recommendations that all of our local services need to consider. Um, and in, in later slides, we'll be looking at some of the wider determinants and some of the key risk groups that we all need to, to consider as well around improving mental health and well-being. Um, so as I've said, it's around in, including support um, for mental health in all of our service designs um, and ensuring that our workforce really understands, the kind of health and care workforce, understand the support that's available in the community around the wider determinants of health. So that might be, for example, citizens advice around financial support, acts on energy around um, fuel poverty and support with energy bills, which can be really important over the winter, um, as well as wider support um, for particular needs, be it domestic violence and abuse, be it healthy lifestyles, support as a whole raft there. So there's a programme of making every contact count training that can be accessed by anybody um, and if you're, you or your colleagues haven't made use of MEC training please do have a look for that. Um, and that touches really on yeah the next point is a similar one there around development of that uh, system knowledge, improving access to information and support both for people, um, frontline workers and also for residents so they can um, really understand 
the raft of support that is already available but often underused and whilst doing that we do need to think about the needs of particular groups who may find it harder to access support or be at greater risk of poor mental health outcomes. So children, young people, people with autism and carers listed there, but I'll come on to talk about a few more in a moment. And then really encouraging um, service providers and commissioners to have really strong feedback mechanisms. The engagement that we had through this needs assessment was so valuable and I know co-production approaches are growing within the system. So really just supporting that we um, continue to strengthen that in terms of building on the experience and the knowledge of people with lived experience. So I'm conscious of time, so just briefly touching on some of the key wider determinants. Housing and homelessness, we know, as I've said, are a big risk factor um, around poor mental health. So I've spoken about um, Act on Energy, who can support around fuel poverty. Um, and we have, we have a, a, a pathway, specialist pathway for mental health support out with outreach workers for people who are homeless. We need to continue that. In terms of employers, we want all employers to um, promote mental health first aid courses, mental health awareness courses, suicide prevention courses. Uh, one of the few benefits of the pandemic is from a public health perspective, we've had great engagement with um, workplaces off the back of COVID prevention and response measures. And we're building on that to now really encourage them to think about broader mental health and um, physical health support for their employees. We know that good work is really important for mental health. The move to online support obviously has been very beneficial for some. Um, it's obviously helped reduce COVID transmission, but actually there is a risk that some will be excluded. So we really need to consider how we support service users who don't have access to online services, as well as alongside that building digital inclusion um, through all that we do. Thinking about how we support young people, I should say the needs assessment was primarily focused on adults, but obviously we couldn't overlook, overlook the impacts that the pandemics had on young people. And I took uh, here the IPS service, so individual placement support. This is an employment support service for people with mental ill health that is in the system, and we need to continue to grow and embed that, working with more employers to support people to have access to good work. Uh, touched on green spaces as well, the importance really of, of promoting that and enabling access and again community engagement to understand how we can better improve access is going to be key. We think about travel, um, we know that active travel, so walking, cycling is really good for both your physical and your mental health, um, so promoting that. Um, is a real priority for the system. Alongside that, we know that road safety is important. So road traffic accidents and the physical injuries people may, um, may get for, as a result of a traffic accident has really important psychological impacts as well. So road safety is key going forwards. The pandemic has obviously impacted um, family relationships. Uh, a study back in July 2020 found that 12% of people experienced relationship breakdown during the pandemic with a, a friend or a family member. Um, and I said that can be a real risk factor for poor mental health and well-being. So that's something we need to support people to get access to relationship focused support if they need it. Uh, we have a whole local domestic violence needs assessment and strategy that has recently been published. There's one for Coventry and one for Warwickshire, so please do have a look at those um, if you feel you need to have a better understanding of the needs and the support available to people experiencing domestic violence or abuse. Um, and we need to continue and expand mental health support for people with drug and alcohol issues as well. So there can be challenges with um, people that experience both mental health and both drug and alcohol um, misuse where, where maybe they, they kind of bounce between services. We do have a protocol in place to improve how services join up, but that is something again that needs ongoing attention. Um, touched on some of the, the inequalities experienced around mental health um, and within our ethnically diverse communities. We have a programme of work at the moment working with um, artists to capture and, and, um, and promote, uh, well, and share people's experiences around mental health to try and encourage um, greater talking, greater help seeking, reduce stigma and encourage help seeking behaviours and we'll promote those um, in due course. 
again, community engagement with ethnically diverse communities and LGBTQ plus communities, really important to ensure that we understand and better address the needs of these groups that again can be at higher risk. Veterans are another group that we know are at higher risk. Uh, depression, anxiety is about 30% is about 30% um, prevalence amongst veterans who have been deployed compared to around 20% in the general population. So you can see the disparity there. So please try to understand if you have veterans accessing your services. Um, it's really important to identify them and to support them appropriately. Similarly with carers, in all that you do, please think about the carers of those that are maybe supporting people that you're working with, supporting them to access support um, and encouraging them really to think about their own physical and mental well-being. So promoting the five ways to well-being can be really important for carers as well in terms of supporting self-care and helping them to keep well. And then whilst we focus on adults within the needs assessment, we recognise that the transition period is so crucial in terms of enabling people to um, move into adulthood feeling well supported. We have recently launched a new peer mentoring support service by Coventry Warwickshire Mind, who will, who will work with young adults in that transition period to support them. Um, and again, that peer support can be really valuable in that kind of shared experience space. I'm almost there. Um, and then there's a broader category when we talk about inclusion health groups. So that can be anyone that might be marginalised from uh, within society. So people who are homeless, um, people with substance misuse issues, it could be people with disabilities, uh, it could be young carers, anyone that really could, may be considered on the margins of um, society. And again, really needing to improve engagement and trust with those groups. Um, in order that we can um, better support their mental health and well-being. So just to, to summarise, I think there's a lot in this document and I hope some of it you, you found relevant to yourselves and your areas of work. When addressing mental health and well-being, as I've said, it's not just about um, the services, the mental health services that may be available, but we need to take this whole population model approach so really considering both access to services and, and streamlined support across all of our providers but also thinking about those really important determinants um, income wealth education employment housing etc really key influences as are some of our physical health behaviors so smoking and um, stopping smoking if you're experiencing depression and anxiety can actually be as effective as taking medication um, and substance misuse, alcohol misuse, whilst often used as a kind of self-medication are obviously not particularly helpful and will actually have worse impacts on your mental health in the longer term. And physical activity and good diets can really help support our well-being too. And then the environment in which we live. So that touches on um, both the kind of access to green spaces, but also those social networks that we have in communities. We know that being Lonely can be as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day so in terms of your kind of mortality risk, but is such a key factor in terms of good mental health and well-being as well that um, we really need to build social connections within communities. And as I touched on earlier, promoting that idea of mental health friendly, inclusive communities. <laughs> 